So let's begin by defining a simple isolated system. And the system, let's say we start out in state one. And we're going to define the internal energy as U1. And there's lots of different options for how you represent energy. And, and many books prefer E, uh, but many also use U. And I'm going to try to stay consistent throughout this lecture series and do my best to stay with, with U. So the system transitioning from state one to state two, the energy internal energy now changes from U1 to U2. But because it's isolated, because it's isolated, therefore U1 is equal to two, U2, right? There's no way for energy to enter or, or leave the system. Great, so let's now take our system again. and put the system in contact with the universe or the universe not part of the system. And we'll say that it's in contact via an adiabatic wall. An adiabatic wall, an adiabatic wall is one in which work can be exchanged, but no heat or uh, matter. So we've got an adiabatic wall, and that means that work can be done. Now, here's where we're going to have a, to uh, re rely on convention. And the convention that we use is that work is defined as the work done by the system on the universe. And I'm going to draw this in red arrow W. So this is the picture to keep in your mind. And that means that when W is greater than zero, work is done by the system. And when work is less than zero, work is done on the system or to the system. And, and frankly, I, I find this sometimes confusing. It uh, means you're messing around with, with negative signs. So, for me, having this picture is, is really important. Uh, so if in the process of going from state one to state two, delta u is equal to u2 minus u1, that is equal to minus w. 
right? Because if W is positive, if W is positive, then that corresponds to work being done by the system on the universe, which means energy is leaving the system. Energy has to transition from the system into the universe through work. Okay, go back to our same system. And if we replace the adiabatic wall, with now a uh, conducting wall, that means that heat can flow into or out of the system. And the definition that we're going to use is this. So Q is defined as heat into system, which means that Q greater than zero into system Q less than zero heat out of system. And that means that delta U is equal to U2 minus U1. is equal to Q. So if Q is positive, that corresponds to an increase in the energy because heat's flowing into the system, carrying energy with it. And combined then, you can imagine two reservoirs or you know maybe it's the system in general but this is the picture of q and w and this means oh, darn it this means that delta u is equal to u2 minus u1 is equal to Q minus W. So this is the convention, and this is our first law of thermodynamics, that the internal energy uh, changes with the flow of heat in or work out. Uh, now, the Gaskell textbook, which we're following, uh, uses a notation, which again, it's a little bit confusing, uh, but we're gonna go with it just for the sake of allowing you to have a textbook to follow along. And they say, for an infinitesimal change, du is equal to del q minus del W. So we know that du is our differential, the change in energy. And then we're saying that delta Q and delta W are infinitesimal changes in heat and work that correspond to the infinitesimal change in the total energy. And that's because you know we're not going to formally be using Q and W as state variables, right? Our state variables are you know, pressure, temperature, volume, et cetera. But this is gonna be a way for us to, to carry work and heat through our uh, discussion.
Now the internal energy is a state variable. And it's a pretty useful one, right? Because remember, we want to write our equation of state in terms of independent state variables. So we have to pick one of our state variables. And typically, we want to write using a state variable that, well, the variables that we vary are things that we want to be able to control easily. And we can't easily control you. I mean, we, we don't uh, have a knob on any of our devices that say energy, right? We've got knobs that control pressure. We've got knobs that control temperature, but nothing that controls energy. So U is a very handy state variable. And the consequence of this is that U can be written as a function of our independent variables. Another consequence is that we can now write the differential of u as the, uh, in terms of these independent variables. So let me, uh, Let me write this out because I want to show you the notation I'm using. You'll find this useful, possibly. EP1 Okay, so I wrote this out and uh, this first term is the partial of u with respect to uh, variable p1 holding p2 through pn constant dpn1. Here we have the partial of u with respect to variable two holding one and three through n constant dp2 dot 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 plus and this is the partial of u with respect to p n uh, holding p1 through n minus one constant d p n. Okay, we got that. And it also means that now we can integrate and whoop, d u1 u2 d u. We can diff, uh, integrate our differential. And if we integrate around in a circle through any path, of course, from u2 to u1, the u, which means that if we were to take and we add those two together, they have to be equal to zero. And this is. That's path independent. And that, that's something which is handy because if we have two known states, we can take different paths and investigate those knowing that we're going to have a uh, uh, resultant that is zero. So what do we have for these systems? Well, we have heat and work. Now, heat we're going to come to this later. 
what's important here is that work is everything that's not heat. And that's great because whoops, this means that if we understand how to deal with these two variables, you know, W or Q and W, then we can deal with everything because work can be, you know, pressure volume, It can be elastic energy, plastic, and these are stress and strain. It can be electric. There's going to be electric field and displacement. Magnetic, chemical, etc. Anything, everything, everything that's not heat. So now that we have this, we can we can work with this. And in our case, right? We're starting with pressure volume. Right, so work is delta P V is equal to V delta P plus P delta V. And oftentimes textbooks will set one of these constant. which means that delta P goes to zero. So you'll wind up with W is equal to P delta V. Now, again, this is something I mentioned this because I want you to be aware of this when you're looking in textbooks, particularly when you're looking at these introductory sections, uh, you'll find in the text that say, oh, well, under pre constant pressure conditions, dot, dot, dot. And then they go through a derivation and that derivation may last for a page, page and a half, two pages, uh, the whole time carrying with it, this delta P goes to zero. So you need to be very careful reading that this is, is carried, uh, that this, sorry, that this is uh, uh, in the kind of the, the back of your mind while you're reading. And in the case of our energy differential, in the case of a constant pressure, then du is equal to partial of u with respect to volume at constant temperature, dv plus partial of u with respect to temperature, constant volume, dt. And this is giving us u as a function of volume and temperature. What if uh, delta V and delta P are both zero? Well, when that happens, then work is zero. I mean, again, we're only allowing pressure volume work. If you had other forms of work, you know, you get the idea. So when there's no work, then dq minus del w is equal to du. That is zero. It's equal to du by dv t dv. plus du by dt v dt, zero. And you're left with 
Ooh, terrible writing. Actually, my writing's not great here at all, but uh, I am actually pretty sorry about that. Uh, del Q is equal to DU is equal to the partial of U with respect to temperature volume DT. Now, something that the textbook, your textbook and others sometimes do, but not always, is put a little V there. To specify constant volume. Um, I tend to let that slip in my work, but nonetheless, that uh, is what happens when there's no work. Okay, so let's go back. And we have delta U is equal to Q minus W. And we can rewrite this. Q is equal to delta U plus W. And we define this as delta H is equal to H2 minus H1. So this is by definition, the enthalpy. So transitioning from state one to state two, a certain amount of heat is gonna flow into the system and that change in the heat is represented by Q and that is uh, delta H. So it's worth pointing out that, that we can take, uh, our constant P condition where W is equal to P delta V, Q at constant pressure is equal to delta U plus P delta V is equal to U2 minus U1 is equal to P U2 minus P, sorry, uh, V2, V1 is equal to U2 minus P V2 minus U1 plus P V1 H2 minus H1 is equal to delta H. So what this means, or the implications of this are, is that under constant volume conditions, otherwise known as no PV work, delta Q subscript V is equal to DU is equal to DU by DT V. And coming down here under constant pressure, but allowing for there to be pressure volume work, the flow of heat into the system, constant pressure, is equal to the change in the enthalpy. And, oops, kind of to summarize that, dQ by 
dt, a constant v is equal to du by dt at constant v. I'm gonna try to write that a little bit nicer. <laughs> du by dt a constant v is equal to del q, sorry, delta q dt a constant v. And this we define as the constant volume heat capacity. And similarly, dH by dT at constant P is equal to del Q dT at constant P. And this is our constant pressure heat capacity, right? And that means that du is equal to CV dt and dh is equal to CP dt. So these U and H are both useful expressions of the state function. And worth pointing out that they both are essentially state functions. They're just a different way of regrouping, regrouping these variables, right? Here, we rearranged it so that instead of us using the internal energy, we're now using the heat flow as or the fl flow of heat into the system as our state variable, the enthalpy. And in the case when there's constant volume, so work isn't being done, this constant volume heat capacity is used. And in the case when there is a change in the pressure, then you use the, uh, but, but the, the volume changes. So sorry, when the pressure is constant, the volume changes, uh, then we can use the constant pressure heat capacity. And it's worth pointing out that these are energy per temperature, so joule per Kelvin in units, uh, but oftentimes in terms of, of measurement and, and what we carry around is instead a uh, molar unit. So if we take CV divided by N, we get little c v. Now your textbook uses a capital C and a lowercase c. I find it difficult to distinguish. Well, my handwriting's bad, I understand, but a big C versus a little C look a lot alike. So I use this uh, bar to distinguish those in my, in my personal handwriting. Uh, so I, I call this the uh, uh, molar heat capacity. And you have Cp by N is equal to Cp. So uh, be aware of these. This is a uh, joule per 
Kelvin, mole, or whatever units of energy and temperature you choose. But there has to be a mole in there. And kind of a last comment uh, rounding out this lecture is that uh, PV. Well, we're using PV because that is a simple variable that we can think about and visualize. It's also historically a significant part, right? Because a lot of the original work was done with, with fluids and gases. The important thing is that this pressure volume is going to yield an energy, right? Or a work, right? Energy and work, right? Because pressure is going to be atmospheres and uh, volume is going to be in, say, liters. And atmosphere, that could also be, you know, Pascal, which is uh, Newton per meter squared. Liters, that could be meters cubed, which gives you meters cubed. Meters squared, meters cubed come out, give you Newton meters. And we know that energy is force times a distance, right? You're pushing some, some block on a system with some force, some distance. The energy it takes to move this block by delta x at a given force, that's a work and has units of energy. And the same is true for all of these work variables. We pick the work variables in such a way, whether it's uh, electric field and dielectric displacement or uh, stress strain, you always have a uh, force term, call this a force like term and a um, conjugate uh, displacement. Displacement like term, right? And in the case of stress, your stress is your force like term and your displacement like term is your strain. And, you know, people have gone as far, and we don't do this here, but people have gone as far as to talk about temperature as, as a force and entropy as a volume. So there's lots of ways that, that you, can, you can do this. Uh, and again, I, I find pressure volume a little bit sometimes difficult to think about because I you always think of the sign of volume and pressure and how it's related uh, to energy but it's something that we live with. And through the beginning of this text, this is how, of this lecture series, is how we're gonna work. Uh, and there's a historical reason for that. And in much the same way, you know, if we talk about uh, this picture, right? There's an historical reason for that because this looks a lot like a heat engine, right? You put heat into the system and then the, or the engine, and then the engine does work on the universe. And, and that's where it comes from. So uh, these are the definitions of, of uh, work and heat and how we think about the flow of these. And we've introduced here a, a new uh, state variable that we can use that comes about by rearranging the terms.